So with that said, we'd like to welcome all of you to um, this project management session. Um, the title of our session is Adapting Project Management to Changing Time. And um, we're gonna spend the next little while kind of sharing some of our experiences, our background, um, and how we've really had to adapt and how we've also seen things adapt um, across project management, right? And um, kind of our take on what the future will look like, right? Just from our own organizations and our own departments. So with that said, my name is Tanisha Townsend. I am the VP of programs for the uh, Project Management Institute, Western Idaho chapter. And for those of you who are members of PMI, um, this course or this session is worth 0.75 PDUs. So um, make sure after you're done attending today that you um, file for, for credit um, for attending the session. We want this to be very interactive. We don't have all the answers. We're going to share from our experiences, our background, and the things that right we real world went through over the last uh, year or so, right? Year and it just keeps getting longer and longer. <laughs> so it's like, um, so we'll be sharing um, but we welcome you to please put comments in the chat. <clears throat> um, we we think we know how to invite you on stage to share real time with us, um, but we'll figure that out. So um, put your comments in the chat. We'll monitor the chat and um, and we'll we'll definitely um, field all those questions or comments. So with that said, um, let's get started. As I said, I am Tanisha Townsend, VP of Programs for the Project Management Institute, Western Idaho Chapter. Um, I also work for uh, Micron Technology. I manage uh, the program management team for the global supply chain. I've been in the field of project management for I don't even want to say how many years, um, but about uh, over 15. So we'll put it, that's that's a good place to land. Um, over 15 years. And um, with that, just to have seen the field change and emerge, I originally came in with more of an IT focus and then have gone from doing IT project management to program management, back to IT project management, to uh, managing federal and state programs and projects. And um, now I'm doing global supply chain. So um, I would like to introduce the rest of our panel. I'll start with Colleen and let her introduce herself and give us a little bit about her background. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Colleen Sollers. Um, I, I, my day job, I work at HP. I'm um, a 3D software program manager um, for the orthotics vertical business at HP. And I have been in project management longer than Tanisha, let's just say, <laughs> 25 plus years. Uh, let's see, I have really seen a lot of change in the project management industry for sure. Um, I also volunteer as uh, president-elect at PMI Western Idaho chapter, and I'm really glad to be here and uh, contribute to this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Craig? Yeah, thanks, uh, Tanisha. I'm, I'm Craig Hardesty. Uh, I am uh, currently a uh, project manager in the IT group at St. Luke's. Um, been there for about four years. Um, prior to St. Luke's, I spent about 16 years at, at HP, um, which is where I started things off um, in their quality, quality groups um, and uh, did did quality project management, program management there. Um, I have my PMP and a PGMP from uh, the years at HP. And um, uh, I am also on the board of directors at uh, PMI um, Western Idaho chapter. I'm the VP of membership. So that's me. Awesome, thanks Craig and Holly. Hello, is it bad that I'm like, okay, make sure you're not Make sure you're <laughs> No, don't worry. We'll tell you if you're muted. Don't worry. We'll, know, we'll hear like from you. After a year, we should all be, you know, used to this, right? Um, I'm Holly Suit. I'm a project manager at Access Idaho. I have been at Access Idaho almost 15 years, and we primarily work with state, county, and city government entities to help them put services online. Prior to Access Idaho, I did, I was at HP for about five years in third-party support 
and before that, to crucial technology and a couple startups. So I've had opportunities to do project management in both large and small organizations, and I've definitely learned a lot along the way. Awesome. Thank you, Holly. All right. So we're going to jump right into our first question. And again, uh, moderator panel, feel free to, you know, kind of chime in here and, and um, let's collaborate. I'm not directing the questions to any one specific person, but to the entire panel. So um, let's just start out with talking about how did your organization adapt to the COVID restrictions and how what were the immediate impacts that your project teams felt and that you as project managers felt and had to respond to? I guess I can start. So uh, we are a very small team and primarily we're working in an agile two week sprint scrum methodology, but we were old school. Everybody was responsible for their own sticky notes. We had the big board. We stood up every morning. Everybody put their notes on the board, talked about their impediments, what they were doing, what they completed. So we had to make that full shift from going from really paper to online and finding tools that worked for our team to kind of mimic that in-person stand up online. So that came with some challenges. I also found it was a lot more work for me. Um, to adapt because before I just showed up with my list of sticky notes and now it's the whole get up, make sure the screens are ready, the things are loaded, everybody has access. So it's been a shift that way. Um, there's good and there's bad to that shift. And there's definitely things I think I'll keep moving forward, but that was a big change for our organization. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, are we just gonna go around? Is that yeah, one of the yeah. Issues? Yeah, so, um, from a St. Louis perspective, obviously COVID made a big impact, right? Not only on the kind of the front line, all the doctors and all the clinical staff, um, but uh, from a from a kind of a support staff PM project perspective, huge difference because you know we were never told you have to stay home, but. 95% of the people did, <laughs> like, I'm not going in. Um, so, you know, from mid to late March, um, you know, St. St. Luke's has always been a, you know, on, on premise kind of place and the entire workforce left, right? So um, huge difference in, in how we, you know, work together. Um, and um, and also, you know, it, it created a, a kind of another crisis because the infrastructure wasn't there from a from a from a uh, telephone and and um, you know that kind of infrastructure that all of a sudden you have you know ten thousand people who used to work you know together and now are dialing in. So it was a it was a huge impact on on the infrastructure um, right out of the barrel to to make sure everybody could. Um, uh, you know, dial in, and we were, we just weren't used to the tools, right? So um, there, there was a big, big learning curve between March and the summer. Okay, Colleen. Well, I'm I'm going to kind of contrast a little bit what Craig and Holly have said because um, at HP we're a very large global enterprise, and um, we have been working with offshore development teams for years, and uh, so from our perspective, from a project team perspective, really little change because we've already been working remotely um, and having to, you know, overlap, you know, just the two hours in the morning with India and with, you know, when your stakeholders are in, in Europe and your development team is in India and your testers are in China, you know, you're already working around the clock uh, virtually. And so... From that re regard, there's actually didn't notice a whole lot of change. However, we, you know, the, there there still were teams that were were co-located, like smaller scrum teams, because what we usually do, we also do agile, and what we would usually do is scrum of scrums. So we would have the best of both worlds, where we would have the uh, local scrum team in India, and then the local scrum team in Vancouver, and then, um, you know, another scrum team somewhere else or in China, and then then we would have a scrum of scrums virtually, right? So, so we, we, and we had to give, everyone had to go home, so we didn't have those local 
in-person stand-ups anymore. And yeah, we had we had an adaption that way. Um, but as far as um, you know, working on globally distributed virtual teaming, we've been doing that for years already. So it, from from our perspective, it wasn't as huge of a change. Yeah, likewise, um, Colleen, I'm, I'm more similar to you. We did have some changes at Micron um, that we had to kind of adapt to, which is everybody, you know, being virtual, but we also have global teams as well. And so there, we were used to some of that overlap, but still a lot of our stuff we did face to face and even our meetings um, with our, our global team members were also done, you know, in a conference room face to face. And so that shift, um, was was a bit of a paradigm shift for for us right kind of um understanding that new uh interaction with everyone like right not just one or two people that was usually the exception right but now it's the rule um and it's mm -hmm. more of the the norm as we've gone forward um so let's let's continue um according to a recent report published by the mckinsey management company they noted that 85 percent of companies have accelerated digitalism as part of their efforts to respond to COVID. Um, how, how have your organizations or have your organizations, are your organizations in that 85% of the digital acceleration? Um, obviously shifting from in-person like Holly was talking about, um, what, what does that look like for you now? Um, what, what does the, the digital experience or digital project management, what does that look like for you guys now? For us in our situation, um, I've kind of switched. We don't do the larger team meetings as often. I have smaller, shorter meetings with individuals and we kind of go through the testing on screens. We share screens, go through it in order to, in an attempt, I think, to be respective of everybody's time because I found that everybody was having to schedule a Zoom meeting to get time with anybody. And there was actually no time to actually do work because everybody had all these Zoom meetings. So I try to keep an almost open Zoom and then I'll talk to one developer. We go through, we do the testing, talk about what they're gonna do for the day. And then I just slack the next one. like, okay, can you call in now? And um, if they need to work together, it has been a really good thing kind of in that pair program scenario because they're both right there. We all have our computers, we, they can share the code, look at the code. So I have seen a lot of benefit to the Zoom and the screen sharing from a pair programming perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. Craig? Yeah, it's, got, it was, it, it's a little bit uh, hit and miss uh, with us because you know we, we we had to really ramp up on the technology, right? So we, we adopted Teams, we were kind of playing with Teams, the, what a year and a half ago two years ago whenever it was but you know all of a sudden we had to right so there was a lot of uh, kind of learning curve on how we we met um i think from a um you know we didn't have to we, we didn't do the whole um you know physical you know scrum uh, activities like holly was talking about so we didn't have to make that shift um because you know we still had you know we still you know used all the all our electronic tools that that we did um but i i, I hadn't thought about the meetings because it is it's a lot easier on the phone to invite everybody to all the meetings right so you don't have to have, find a conference room for 85 people you just say yeah you send it out um and so that uh, i hadn't actually thought about that holly that that um uh, that we've had to kind of make those adjustments because that that did come up. I you know just just uh, last week um, we were kind of regrouping on a on a project that had been on hold and and we said you know when we were meeting the, this communication meeting that we had when we really did have like thirty people in every call um, and the calls as you guys know tend to focus on one area <laughs> when you do that because one conversation goes and we're like you know we had three people talking in this meeting all the time and then three other people would be talking the next week let's just have two separate meetings with those six people and and, and if and if the if the other 20 are needed we'll invite them so uh, yeah that's that's good a call out so we we've been we've been making adjustments to see how this technology works um uh, as, as we went along and, and we're still trying to figure it out 
Yeah. Colleen? Uh, so it's funny because at HP, like I said, we've been doing virtual teaming for years, mostly on um, Zoom. And But now it's like, it's almost like there's a, a huge proliferation of more tools, you know, more like now we got, we got all these choices. Now we got teams, we got, you know, zoom, we got, you know, what are you going to use? You know, and, it, and it's, it's kind of crazy right now because people, I think were just sort of in the beginning, they were just freaking out going, you know, wow, we need more tools, more tools. When in fact, we really didn't need more tools. We just needed to be able to use the tools we had more efficiently. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have this proliferation of tools and it's a little bit nuts, but um, we've pretty much um, um, landed on Zoom as, as our, our primary tool for, for tele video conferencing. But we also use Teams quite a bit for, um, um, you know, collaboration. And one of the things that has changed for us, because we have these gigantic programs and, you know, the toughest thing to do, I think, uh, remotely is detailed design work. Okay, when you're having to do collaboration with your architects and your t your tech leads and your uh, product owner, and it's that it's that collaboration where we used to get in a room sometimes when we were kicking off a really large project and and get you know fly people in and and have those you know three day sessions where you're whiteboarding and and all of that stuff and it was really good to just get everybody aligned um on the same um on the same strategy on the same you know design principles and everything and then we could go back to our corners of the world and all work very effectively virtually but it was that initial it's that initial kickoff meeting when you're having to do some really heavy design work um that's the hardest thing to to do i think virtually and so we've had to use the tools um like uh you know white virtual whiteboarding uh we use that a lot we use um uh the um the teams so people can actually edit files you know you know you know real time on online together but the hardest part is you know somebody's always in a bad time in a in a bad time of day when you're trying to do collaboration work remotely it's somebody's always going to be dialing in for 10 o'clock at night or a 5 a.m meeting and so that's kind of the toughest thing um to deal with but yeah yeah no those are all good good things i guess as a follow-up question um how have the the team members right so your project team members responded to all these changes in technology to, you know, now you got to use, you know, where you used to just whiteboard on the wall, you know, now you have to whiteboard in a tool, right? And and are are, are they kind of just tech stressed, right? It's just, it's just too much. Is it overload? Some of them are. Some of them just love it. You know, some of them, I mean, we are a technology company. So um, a lot of the, the, the engineers are techie you know techie techie and they just adapt to new stuff really quickly i think it's more the management that's that struggles um <laughs> than it is the develop the development teams um and they're very willing to try new things um uh so it kind of depends on what what role you're in i think in terms of adoption of all the new of all the new technologies yeah, I think we we haven't completely figured it out because we have a mixed bag. So, um, I work in in the IT group, and and when we're when we're doing more of a technical kind of uh, project, it it's fine, right? Um, I still haven't. I'm a I'm a whiteboard guy, <laughs> and mm -hmm. it still bugs me because I I, yeah. I hate the whiteboard. I saw um, Anita has a question in the chat about a white you know, tips on usage of whiteboards. Maybe Colleen is better at, to answer that because I haven't figured it out because I can't draw on you know the the, the whole mouse thing. I need a a, a a marker and and that. But what the the difference is that you know our our user community isn't necessarily uh, tech savvy like this, right? You know, we have doctors, we have providers that are, are great 
with technology, um, but you know, it's really more of a it, the conversation is more of a, a personal conversation with a lot of our users and our because because they're right there, um, and we actually miss that a lot. Um, I think you know being be, being able to go because we can go now. You know, we got the whole masking thing, and everything. But early on, you know, they said no travel unless it was vital, right? Um, to patient care, you're not going anywhere, right? So we lost that whole conversation with our user communities where we would normally have that interaction, that personal face-to-face, -face, like Colleen was mentioning, we'd get in a room and, and talk through this um, or meet people where they actually, you know, perform their job. And we lost that. And, and I still, that that has not been replaced by zoom meetings and, and calls you, you just can't do it you can't you can't sit with a user right and watch their process because you, you know you know and we all know that they can describe their process and it has nothing to do with what they actually do right so when you go and you look at it and go eh, yeah these, these 12 steps you totally left out mm -hmm. so um you know we do miss that and, and like i said may, maybe colleen or, or somebody else has a better option on the tools for whiteboarding and collaboration like that. I don't know. Yeah. Colleen, what tools are you using for whiteboarding? Online virtual. We just whiteboarding. use the the Zoom. The yeah. Zoom, you know, whiteboarding. Um I think it you know the the hardest thing, well, it's kind of like think about it when you're when you're physical, you don't have 10 people going up to the whiteboard at once, right? <laughs> when you're in a physical room whiteboarding but when you're on zoom they're all in there you know scribbling on the thing you know all at once and so i've been like okay wait a minute guys can we maybe take turns here because this is getting a little nuts and um so you know it's stuff like that you know uh for whiteboarding um but yeah i'm like with craig i'm you know i'm i'm accustomed to picking up a you know uh, a whiteboard pen and an eraser and doing my thing and then taking a picture of it and converting it to a slide, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, now it's like, we're trying to have to work the tool you pay. It's, it's almost like it, it breaks your train of thought. You have an idea that you want to, you know, get out of your head. And, and in order to do that, you have to like, figure out this other tool so it's almost distracting you from the actual yeah. idea that you're trying to put yeah, where do you put it at? and i struggle not just whiteboard but just i there's so many options about where i can keep this note right i have this idea mm -hmm. where do i write it down well i can use word i can use one note i can use you know email i can use <laughs> and, and and i find myself i get in these traps of like well today i'm using this tool tomorrow <laughs> i'm going to use the other one yesterday yeah. this and then it's like where the heck did i write that i i remember writing it but i have no idea where it's at so. yeah and that's that's true one of the things that we did right that i did with my team of of project managers and program managers um as we shifted to this totally online right totally virtual was before or in the middle of all the projects that we had going on we created a repository right this is where we are keeping this 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 so because it was a shift for everyone right now things that you know maybe you would get in email we weren't using email because there was an oversaturation of email right and so nobody was reading the emails and so we had to be creative on how do we make sure that you're actually digesting the information that you know you're getting out of these zoom meetings right and um so so we made some shifts that way to be a little more formal um in giving some guidance as to where you can find what we also more organized yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's important that's critical yeah otherwise it just becomes a big graveyard of content you know yeah you can't find anything so i'd like to ask you guys a question i'd like for you to share um what what did kind of this whole COVID crisis experience from a project management perspective um what did it teach you about project management, good and bad? And just kind of give us a, a little blurb about, about that. Well, from, from my perspective, I think it taught me how absolutely critical the role of the project manager is still, right? Even, and especially in a virtual environment, because um, as we all know, as PMPs, 
communication is 90% of the job. And it's even more than that. I think it's probably more like 100% of the job. Um, and then uh, it, when you're virtual, because it's keeping all these people connected and aligned and informed, right? The small things, the little conversations that used to happen in the hallway now need to get transmitted out to the whole team as opposed to, you know, something, you know, um, what do they call that in agile um, osmosis, right? So, so we have to work much harder at communicating things. And I'm always now finding myself, oh, I had this really great conversation with so-and-so, but so-and-so wasn't there. So I need to get that person person and you know and I'm constantly having to to uh, manage all that white space and that I think is the most critical role of the project manager in um, in a virtual setting I have that yeah almost fear to call like I don't ever want anybody to feel like I've excluded them because I for sure have not done it on purpose you know and yeah so I try to keep everything open like if you have questions call me this is what this meeting's about. You're not required, but if you want to attend, you're more than welcome because that, I just don't want people to feel like they're being left out. And like you said, yeah, you have these signed conversations in Slack or Zoom or whatever. And then you realize, oh yeah, these other people probably should have been involved in this conversation. So I agree a hundred percent. And I, I, uh, th that's a great point, Colleen. I hadn't thought about the, the, um, the, the soft interactions, right? That the, the you know, everybody talks about the the um, you know hallway conversations and things, but even even like walking down a a row, and you know seeing Sally there, and oh hey Sally, and maybe have a quick conversation, and oh you know, and and maybe I owed her something or she owed me something, and just kind of a reminder, a tickler, where virtually, you can go a week. <laughs> right between a meeting right and totally forget you were supposed to do something right because your actions are in 15 other places and you know it, it didn't it didn't it wasn't in your mind until you saw sally's name on the meeting go ah crap i forgot to do that so yeah. a lot of that is, is is super important i from a from a saint luke's perspective i you know our business changed ways right you know hp you probably you know just keep doing your what you're doing um you know, our our all of our projects were kind of put on hold. It's like prioritization, change, everybody, all hands on deck. What are we going to do, right? Um, and and we had to go from kind of normal business, you know, upgrading this and doing that and changing this to how do you put a pharmacy in a parking lot in mm. Emmett, right? <laughs> and it was kind of like totally. It's kind of okay. So everybody changed, and I and I really. I think this has taught us um, a lesson in flexibility, right? That that we have to at any moment, you know, or not we have to, but we can. Right? I think we prove to ourselves we can um, make this kind of adjustment when we needed to. And I and I think that was that's been a really good lesson for those of us um, in, in these kind of situations where we actually had to stop doing what we're doing and you know, put aside our pet projects or whatever, you know, we like to do and, and, you know, get on a team that says, Hey, I need this. Or even, you know, in, in our case, uh, we had to do things that weren't even part of our job. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we, you know, we need to, we need to make sure people, you know, we need to check uh, temperatures coming into the, the hospital and all the clinics, they don't have any more people. So our CIO said, all right, who's going to be there? <laughs> here's, here's the list. And, and we, we could actually, you know, from a technology who's gonna empty bedpans? Well, <laughs> that's definitely the purpose. Um, you draw um, the line there. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, we, we used, um, uh, what is it in Teams? The, the scheduler thing? Um mm -hmm. Can't remember what it's called, but super effectively, right? And, and it was just nice to have a tool that said, "Hey, you know what? We have to have uh, these shifts covered um, in these five places, and so we could all just collaborate and just put your name in. You know, show up five minutes before, and you're going to be there for two hours. And so, um, you know, just from a technology standpoint, that was a lot easier than trying to manage something." 
face to face. I thought it was a disaster. You couldn't have yeah. done it. So that's true. And in some of the research that I did on um on you know, just what other kind of project managers have been, you know, saying at their pain points um, all around kind of out there on the internet. What I found is, and I found this to be true in Micron as well, is um, like Craig said, right? We had to really go through our projects and reprioritize. Um, we didn't necessarily put them on hold and we kind of already had a hybrid approach to project management. So we were doing some agile, right? With our IT interaction, but then waterfall on the other side. So the actual full execution of the project was very much a hybrid. Um, we shifted, right? And we started to look for more opportunities to get things done quicker. So we started to look for more quick wins, more ways that we could get stuff out the door faster. Um, and while that had been, uh, I guess, something, right, that we were, of course, concerned about, um, it really shifted um, our whole, the whole organization's mindset to how can we look for opportunities to get things done quicker and um, look for quick wins. And um, so we've almost shifted in, in some respects from long-term projects, right, to short-term projects. Like the project might have a life cycle of two years, but we're looking for deliverables kind of every three months because now the world is a more fragile space, right? It, it feels like, right? Time is, is something that has more fragility um, than it did before, right? Because I, I think when we approached project management before, we didn't ever think, well, everybody could be locked down and we could be in a pandemic and, you know, but, but now, um, you know, that we've experienced that, right? You understand kind of the fragility of time. And, and so we've been looking at that. Um, what are some of your experiences? I think, for me, I think, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I what think, like, what you're saying, too, applies to the broader organization, even in the world in general. I mean, because look how fast we're getting vaccines and look how fast stuff is getting improved and we're being creative with how we're distributing these. And I hope that's not lost because I think what's come out of this whole situation is the creativity and people coming together to figure out how to get stuff done at all levels of you know business really life you know people picking up your groceries and just kind of the creativity that has come and can we keep that going forward because did we really need these five layers of process and approvals that we had in the past to take things to the next level mm -hmm. you know and i don't know if i'm expressing that in the right way but i think that's just been kind of a shift in the world and i hope that that like cutting be. through the red tape, right? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, the word accelerate is the word of the of the year. Everybody at HP, everybody wants to know how can we accelerate? How can we accelerate? And I'm like, if you if you if I hear that word one more time, I'm going to scream. No, but um, the other challenge though is that um, budgets are frozen. Yeah. And money is a lot, budget is a lot harder to come by. And so you really have to advocate for your program. You have to really um, uh, prove um, uh, value, right? So, so there's a huge shift and, and, you know, as all of our portfolios are being reassessed based on, you know, what you guys are talking about, um, things are getting cut, right? So, so whole programs are getting cut, right? And so, um, it's there's this real uh, feeling of musical chairs, and there's not enough chairs for everybody, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah. so really, I've I've noticed a, a very heightened um, concern around budget. You, we do at HP, we do like pretty much a quarterly. We do an annual budget process, but we flash it quarterly. Well, we flash it every month, but um, and and we try we try to contain changes within a quarter so that you know people can rely on their budget at least for a quarter, right? But now I'm seeing, oh my goodness, you know, we just had our quarterly planning, and now I'm seeing, wait a minute, now they're talking about cutting even cutting more resources. And so what I signed the scope I signed up for, so scope management becomes hugely important because you know 
if you're going to cut my budget, I have to cut my scope. And you got to be prepared with those options and choice points for your executive team. So you can't just take it in the shorts, right? <laughs> well, you could, but you you would you would fail. But what I'm saying is, the focus on the hyper focus on budget has um, really um, changed some of our behaviors in terms of. Um, how we manage scope and 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 how we accelerate things so that we can get them done before the budget gets cut. Right. Hey, Tanique. Yeah, and and I see that Kim put like scope management. Yes, some of these things, right? It's really like it's about time, right? <laughs> um, it, it feels uh, it feels constrained, and it feels it you know, from just a people perspective, right? Um, everybody can kind of feel that pressure and that uncertainty. But some of these things, to Holly's point earlier, um, these are better practices. Is this project really necessary? Can we decrease the scope and still uh, deliver something that is a value add? Um, what, what does that look like? And I mean, there is like everything is under a microscope, like Colleen said. And I think it's organizational, right, across organizations um, that that view of is this a real value and what is the value and is it long term enough? that this project is justified. And how many projects have we all been on as project managers or whatever role you might play, quasi project manager, right? You are you showed up today, you're the project manager. Um, however, you got assigned to be the project manager. Um, and we get halfway through a project and then it's canceled. And so um, I, I appreciate the extra scrutiny of the projects and, and the scope even and, and spending that time. And Craig, you were, you yeah, were well, saying I was, something. I can kind of actually forgotten the question, but I have, <laughs> I have, I a couple of comments. One, one, you know, in at St. Luke's again, it wasn't necessarily about cutting budgets and cutting projects and programs. It was about adding, right? We had, it, we had, we had to stop stuff, right? But it, it wasn't stuff that we could just not do, right? It was it's stuff that we had to delay. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we had to add all this other stuff. So it was, you know, back to that flexibility to say, okay, what, and in just really asking ourselves, what is the most important thing, which is a standard question, but in healthcare, it, it really became really focused, right? We gotta, we gotta not have, you know, you know, we had to protect these environments and, you know, have not people not die. Right. And it was like it was like a life and death thing. It's like, so what what do we really have to do? <laughs> what do we really have to do? And the other thing I thought that we've kind of learned is is the flexibility in where we're working. Right. So kind of full circle on that. Whereas we used to be you got to be in your office. You got to do this and that to really understanding, you know, there, there's pros and cons. Right. There there is there is an upside to not having to be in your office. Right. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, the business um, world learned 15 years ago. Right. And there, there's reasons where maybe you, you don't need to be. Um, and, and the last thing I was going to say is just how we see ourselves as people. Um, it, it is it is no longer a, you know, a, a horrible um, I know career ending thing that if you're on a phone call and your kid starts screaming in the background, right? Or your dog goes berserk or somebody knocks on the door. I mean, it's kind of like life, right? And, and, or and I think there's a right. Well, yeah, the bed. Right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right, right. You know, 10 years ago or last year, you know, it would have been like, you know, so there's this, there's this human element to this whole thing that's that says, okay. Yes, I I am just like you inviting, you know, all you people into my office at home, you know, and, yep. you know, and, and usually I have a background that I can, you know, make yeah. it look like I'm somewhere I <laughs> like to be, but, you know, sometimes we don't. So it's, it's kind of like, okay, we all get it, right? So. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, in that respect that definitely has right taught everybody or reminded everybody like we're human beings right <laughs> um because having a bad day at work in the building was not always okay but you know <laughs> 
your kids can be crazy and be running around and, you know, be a part of your Zoom meeting. And that's totally fine since we've been home. Um, so so I think that it's really allowed people to connect on a more human level, right? And, and have that interaction with Tanisha as a person, right? Not as just seeing me as, you know, Which in my ironic role. Which is ironic when but, you think about it. How, how ironic Yeah. It is, you know? <laughs> You would think yeah, the opposite totally. that you can interact with somebody <laughs> more intimately in person than over video. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, I, it is. It is. But I and I think it's like Craig said, right? We've kind of had to open up our space and open up our world, and that you know makes you open up kind of who you are. Where at work sometimes, you know, you can have your work mask on, right? And and so um, people are not always able to get that full interaction. I have learned, and, though, I mean, and it took a long time for us, I mean, a long time, relatively, um, the whole video thing, you know, um, you know, I spent 10 years on the phone, like, like Colleen, you know, talking to India and all these other places, and it was just phone calls. And you, know, you can recognize people from all over the world by their voice, but you meet them face to face, you have no idea who this person is, right? You yeah. meet them in the hall, right? And yeah. go, who are you? And you know, you, you or you, you walk by somebody who's speaking, and you go, oh, you know. <laughs> I Derek. recognize that voice. I, I have no <laughs> I've never met you before. But but the video has changed a lot because you can it isn't it it's not as good as in person, you know, just from a communication standpoint. But I can tell if Tanisha is not happy with what I just said, which is you, <laughs> you know, or you know, or what whatever it is, right? The the communication and just the face to face. Um it it was it was good going from a from a, a phone call to a picture and but going from a picture to actual video is is a lot better um, than it was at the beginning. Okay, so I think we have like maybe, I don't know how much time we have left, maybe like 10 minutes or so. Um, but I wanna ask you guys, for this is your opinion. Um, what do you think, based on kind of all of your experiences, COVID, pre-COVID, before we even knew what COVID was, now that we've come through COVID, we kind of have a more, we're getting normalized, right? I don't know what normal looks like, um, but we're kind of emerging into this new normal space. What competencies do you think that project managers will have to have going forward? I think it's just, it's really the communication piece um, is critical, that managing the white space ensuring that your team is, because I don't think this is going away, honestly. Um, when you think of how much money we saved with when we grounded people from flying at HP, I mean, our, our exec, executive teams were flying all over the place all the time, right? And they were <laughs> totally grounded. And now you need uh, a president level, L1, they call it. So, so the CEO of the company is L0, and L1 is the pre are the presidents, the executive leadership team. You need executive leadership approval in order to book a plane ticket now at HP. And I don't see that necessarily going away. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but um, I do think that um, this ability to communicate uh globally and all the time and you know very clearly um and to put yourself in that empathetic position where you understand wait this person on my team what kind of information does this person need and and to make sure that you're you know you're the the conduit for for that information or either or don't be a bottleneck but make sure that they're getting what they need so it's all that thinking about um how do i get get you know my team to communicate across time zones and across uh, white space that is going to be huge and then secondly i would have to say it's your scope management um as i was talking about earlier your scope management your scope management skills in um negotiating uh -oh. colleen i think we're yeah. losing you yeah. like is it me <laughs> Can't hear you. All right. Okay. Well, Colleen <laughs> figures that out, and and that's true. Scope management for sure. Um, let's jump over to Holly. 
I think with, to Colleen's point, scope management is a huge piece. I think we're doing a better job of picking out what's necessary and moving forward with those pieces and then evaluating what the next step needs to be depending on how your first round of changes or implementation went instead of building in a huge feature set set from the get-go it is truly almost forcing i think the workforce to be more agile in everything they do because you just limited time limited resources and i think we're getting better at really picking out what's important Okay. And then Craig, I'll pose the same question to you. What competencies do you think that um, project managers will um, have to yeah. have I, as, as I, we go I, forward? I'm with uh, Colleen also with, with the communication. I, you know, I, I, you know, think about project management and I don't think any, um, any basic areas have changed. It's how we do some of that stuff, right? It's, it's how we communicate. Um, not only from from you know using the technology right because because you, you know you, you the PM probably needs to know how to start the meeting you, you know they, they you need to know how I mean that's an obvious thing but but you need to know the the applications right it's it's kind of like oh you know because somebody needs to know this stuff so if you're going to be using a tool I, I think there there has to be competency in in those tools but also I think that you know, really making sure that you've you've covered your assumptions around people about how this is actually working. Uh, know when you do probably need to face to face, right? I'm 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 actually in that situation right now at work where you know we've had these meetings, we've had these the emails have gone back and forth. We're just not getting it. We're you know <laughs> we are not aligning with with. And and it's kind of like as as the PM, it's my job to get these people aligned, right? And I'm about to a point where I'm like, I can't do it with these tools. I I have to go and sit down with this person because I know if I do, because I've done it in the past, we get along fine. But boy, electronically, it's just not happening. So you know, there are there are times when you know different tools, different approaches. Um, have to be used, which is a, a skill I think PMs need to have anyway. But in this environment, it's just, it, for me, it's just highlighted, you know, there are different methods, different tactics, different things you can use um, to, to make it happen. And I think being able to yeah. recognize that too, you know, early and often yeah. is a huge thing before things escalate because tone through electronic communications is a hard <laughs> thing, you know? I'm, I had a conversation with my boss the other day and he sent some emails and I finally had to send him a message. I'm like, can we call and talk about this? I am so confused right now. <laughs> and I mean, it took five minute phone call to figure right. it out. So, yep. yeah. No, this is, this is great. Um, thank you so much, um, Colleen, Craig, Holly, Thank you for sharing your experiences, for sharing your thoughts, right, on even the, the future and, and what things will look like as we go forward in the world of project management. And um, sounds like you guys are doing very well at um, adapting to the continuing change, changing times. And so thanks so much. I think it's time for us to all shift and head over to the main stage for the keynote speaker. So thanks so much, everybody, for attending. We appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye.